in your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 11. We'll begin our reading at verse 1, and we'll read the first few verses of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, hear now the inerrant, infallible, and inspired word of God. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch, when or was translated, that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his most holy word. The topic that I have been assigned in turn with my brethren uh, is the, the, um, the, the topic of faith and reason and the interplay between those two. I am uh, grateful to be able to speak on it, although I will say it is, um, it is with a little bit of trepidation that I come into the pulpit tonight because of what we've already heard. We've heard some wonderful lectures that speak to us about the scriptures as the foundation of our knowledge and so on. I was especially indebted to Dr. Bill because he's paved so much of the way that I had already down in my notes, um, speaking of some of the things. Uh, with regard to man's march into rationalism and then also empiricism and then irrationalism. You'll hear a little bit more about that this evening. Uh, we're grateful uh, also to, uh, to our Office of Ecclesiastical Council who first conceived the idea that we would have a, uh, that we would have a general assembly where we would ha hear lectures on apologetics. Uh, what a wonderful time we have had. We, we, we hope to continue this lecture <laughs> notwithstanding. So, before I begin, let's, let's talk about a few things. The, the first is that, that we speak from a foundation. You've heard that foundation over and again. You've heard that we speak from the scriptures. That when our Lord Jesus Christ says in John chapter 17, Sanctify them in thy truth, thy word is truth. When we hear that our God is a quote-unquote God of truth, that he is a God of knowledge, that he is the Lord God of truth, that when Jesus himself claims concerning himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I was, I was very much uh, excited to hear Dr. Bill uh, speak on what it means when we, when we talk about the word truth, those, those points of reality that are that are those things that we cannot live without. Oh, we can live without, like he said, whether or not he put on a red tie this morning. We cannot live without uh, Jesus Christ died to save sinners. We cannot live without such truths as that. And yet, we, um, we also understand, for a second point of introduction, that we are people that are naturally somewhat foreign to the truth. And because we are somewhat foreign to the truth, naturally, what we do is we make things up. And when we make them up, then we, then we build structures upon such shifting, sand-like foundations. So what we're, what we're going to talk about tonight is the relationship that faith has with reason. And how that uh, the conclusion will be, and we'll look at some historical quotations, we'll look at some definitions from Scripture, and then we'll end with three particular passages that show us um, faith, um, well, that, <laughs> it's a very interesting thing, faith and reason together, then faith without reason, and then finally, I hope to show at, at, at the end from Genesis chapter 3 that man in his uh, pristine or innocent estate was not capable of himself to come to the truth without faith. 
We're going to show, I think, a very reasoned process that ended in destruction. Because faith without reason will not help you. Reason without faith will not help you. All right, well, let's start then. Let's dive into the notes. Um, We're going to talk about some historical things first. In a fair assessment of the history of the relationship between faith and reason, we have some happy ages in which there were, in which the, these two things were seen in, in various ways to complement and augment one another. It, it hasn't always been like it is today where faith is thought to be antithetical to reason. It hasn't always been like that. Even among the quote-unquote great minds of the world. There was a day in which faith and reason were understood to go together. Face it, as we've already heard, we are fallen creatures, but not just fallen. We are not omniscient. And so we must receive something on testimony. Not knowing everything that there is to know means that we're going to take somebody's word for it somewhere. So this is where we begin. We begin with mankind as... as as a finite creature, as not omniscient. And so let's start with, with Aristotle. You say, well, you start with a pagan. Well, let's do that for a moment, just, just to see how that, where Aristotle ended up, okay? So his faith thoughts were the product, yes, he had faith thoughts. His faith thoughts were the products of reasonable or rational reflection on the world as he observed it, hence, perhaps simplistically stated for our purposes tonight, reflections upon motion lead to an unmoved mover, that timeless self-thinker that is behind all things, yet himself unobserved. Did Aristotle ever see his unmoved mover? Well, no. But he received him, didn't he? He thought upon him. He made him the object of his knowledge. This kind of pagan natural theology has served as the pattern for some Christian thinkers as well. Now note how his reasoning led him to a faith commitment to something not seen. In Aristotle, as in in many other professed Christian thinkers, we understand the inadequacy of this approach, leading inexorably away from the God revealed in Scripture to another God which is not the true and living God. We move from from Aristotle briefly to Augustine. For Augustine, faith and reason worked together as well. And there is a decided advancement in this understanding with this relationship. His use of reason, tempered and informed by faith, is a decided advance, a more biblical approach than many of his predecessors. And so we appreciate how revelatory content received by faith formed a foundation for his ratiocination. And yet, he is to be criticized in that he often placed too great a, a revelatory weight in the church herself rather than in Scripture. If, you know, if we're going to critique Augustine, that's where we're going to uh, critique him. Nevertheless, we see in Augustine's this faith-seeking reason, unafraid of reason informed by faith and approaching a healthy relationship between them both. He saw this particularly in the way that God relates to his rational creatures, which he learned from the scripture. For Augustine, acceptance of the glory of the divine mind is that which impressed knowledge upon the rational creature. Some of you perhaps have read the two essays by Dr. Warfield in his collected works that pertain to Augustine. Listen to what Dr. Warfield says about Augustine's view, summarizing it for our purposes here. It was nevertheless quite a new spirit which informed his declarations. The spirit of a pure theism derived not from philosophical predecessors, but from those scriptures which themselves also told him of the true light that lighteth every man who cometh into the world. It was the personal God, therefore, whom he spoke of as the son of the soul, by whose illumination alone can rational verities be perceived the light of the truth by which alone is knowledge of the truth awakened in the soul or changing the figure only the inner monitor and master of the soul it was the personal logos that he had in mind through whose imminent working all things that exist exist 
All things that live, live. All things that understand, understand. Surely, if it be true even of the body that in him we live and move and have our being, it must much more be true of the mind, which, having been made in his likeness, lives and moves and has its being in him that is more excellent, but of course not visible, in an in, but in an intelligible way, so that our spiritual illumination comes from the Logos of God. Anselm, after Augustine, adopted this faith plus reason paradigm. In his proslogium, he embodies the devotion of faith and humility seeking understanding. Listen to what he says. Be it mine to look upon thy light even from afar, even from the depths. Teach me to seek thee and reveal thyself to me when I seek thee, for I cannot seek thee except thou teach me, nor find thee except thou reveal thyself. Let me seek thee in longing. Let me long for thee in seeking. Let me find thee in love and love thee in finding. Lord, I acknowledge and I thank thee that thou hast created me in thine image in order that I may be mindful of thee, may conceive of thee and love thee. But that image has been so consumed and wasted away by vices and obscured by the smoke of wrongdoing that it cannot achieve that for which it was made except thou renew it and create it anew. I do not endeavor, O Lord, to penetrate thy sublimity, for in no wise do I compare my understanding with that. But I long to understand in some degree thy truth, which my heart believes and loves. For I do not seek to understand that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand. For this also I believe, that unless I believed, I should not understand. Whew. The discerning reader will note a few things in this construction. The necessity of revelation, the necessity of faith, the assumed compatibility between reason and faith, the confidence in our Heavenly Father as a part of that faith to answer the prayer for illumination, and the humility, not suspending faith upon the ability to be convinced, but with humble faith, making this request and seeking light. These are all important and commendable parts of the inquiry into the relationship between faith and reason discussed by our early medieval exemplars. And while there are other names to be named, if we're ever to get to a biblical construction, we must move quickly on to a change in this pattern found in Aquinas. Now in Aquinas, the pursuit of knowledge was divided between that which was apprehended by faith, apart from reason, and that which was discernible to reason, working especially through the senses. For Aquinas, not all truth was available to men through their unaided reason. Let's make sure we, get, uh, we don't give Thomas the really bad rap that some give him. For Thomas, only some truth was unassailable, sorry, unavailable uh, through reason alone. But some, tr some truths must be apprehended, even for Thomas, by faith. For instance, the doctrine of the Trinity, but many other things were and, uh, available, and that apart from faith, by reason and reason based upon observation. And if you've ever read Thomas's five ways, you understand what I'm about to say here, and that is that Thomas in his five ways can only go so far, and then at the last minute he imports an entire scriptural understanding to his God, his deity, to which he has reasoned. And we're thankful that he did that. Let's just be clear. We're thankful that he didn't end up an unbeliever pressing rather the consistency or the logic of his argument. We're, we're glad he didn't do that. We're glad that when he got to his, his great designer, he said, And this is thou, O Lord. We're glad he did that. But let's also acknowledge when we say that, that he had no reason in his argument for doing so. Okay, so that's the important point to remember with, with Thomas is that, is that he departed from Anselm and he departed from Augustine in that he believed a rational course reasoning to the true God. And yet, as we, or as Dr. Clark rightly says, now if the cosmological argument, leaving the ontological argument out of consideration is invalid, 
Either Christianity has no direction, which this discussion will, t- I'm sorry, no rational foundation, or a meaning for reason must be found that is independent of Thomistic philosophy. To point out the direction which this discussion will take, it may be said that Thomas's argument will prove to be invalid and his use of reason indefensible. Then an alternate meaning of reason must be given to the Christian system. So, so much for Dr. Clark and Thomas, and I'm sure that in this room that many, many of you have already read those comments. You understand where Dr. Clark is coming from. Essentially for Dr. Clark is if you're going to use the logic of your argument, then you must take it to its end. You cannot stop midway or seven-eighths of the way and then import the living and true God of Scripture to the end of the argument. If you're going to, if you're going to go down that road, you have to go all the way down that road. And so that is why Dr. Clark was fond of saying, well, I don't know how fond he was of saying it, but he said it often enough, that if the ontological argument is true, if the teleological argument is true, and so on, if those are true, then Christianity is false because they never get to the end. All right, well, skipping over other relevant material, we come to the Reformation and the master of Geneva, John Calvin. It is clear that especially in religious knowledge, the knowledge of God, that both reason and faith have an ample part to play in Calvin. First, he states that the manifestation of God in the created world speaks to vain, fallen men, unaided by Scripture and the Spirit of God. Listen to what he says. This is 1.5.14. It is therefore in vain that so many burning lamps shine for us in the workmanship of the universe to show forth the glory of its author. Although they bathe us wholly in their radiance, yet they can of themselves in no way lead us to the right path. Surely they strike some sparks, but before their fuller light shines forth, these are smothered. For this reason, the apostle in that very passage where he calls the worlds the images of things invisible, adds that through faith we understand that they have been fashioned by God's word, Hebrews 11.3. He means by this that the invisible divinity is made manifest in such spectacles, but we have not the eyes to see this unless they be illumined by the inner revelation of God through faith. Faith precedes reason. Faith is the foundation for reason, according to Calvin. He goes on to teach that especially in the highest object of knowledge, God himself, the scripture is absolutely necessary. Reason is of use in this pursuit when coupled with faith, for it receives as true that which God has revealed of himself and receives that word as self-authenticating rather than being brought to the bar of human judgment as if the Bible should stand under the judgment of men, which would be to reverse the true and upright course. Notice what he says. Let this point therefore stand, that those whom the Holy Spirit has inwardly taught truly rest upon Scripture, and that Scripture indeed is self-authenticated. Hence, it is not right to subject it to proof and reasoning. And the certainty it deserves with us, it attains by the testimony of the Spirit. For even if it wins reverence for itself by its own majesty, It seriously affects us only when it is sealed upon our hearts through the Spirit. Therefore, illumined by His power, we believe, neither by our own nor anyone else's judgment, that Scripture is from God, but above human judgment we affirm with utter certainty, just as if we were gazing upon the majesty of God Himself, that it has flowed to us from the very mouth of God by the ministry of men. We seek no proofs, no marks of genuineness upon which our judgment may lean. But we subject our judgment and wit to it as a thing far beyond any guesswork. This is that epistemic certainty you were talking about earlier. By this power, we are drawn and inflamed knowingly and willingly to obey him, yet also more vitally and more effectively than by mere human willing or knowing. Such then is a conviction that requires no reasons, such a knowledge with which Uh, The best reason agrees in which the mind truly reposes more securely and constantly than in any reasons. From Calvin, then, we may with even more brevity uh, mention the post-Reformation scholastics, such men as Heisbertus Vucius and Petrus von Maastricht. 
And here we find that same kind of faith and reason coupled together in propriety as mankind's right way to acquire knowledge and to have access to the truth. The reality of things as created, preserved, and especially revealed and disposed of by God. For example, Vucius in his masterwork on human reason in matters of faith, written in 1636, he writes... No human reason is the principle by which or through which or because of which or why we believe or the foundation or law or norm of what should be believed. Wow, pretty powerful statement. Further, he writes, the Christian faith is founded upon the Bible and the act of believing on the illumination of the Holy Spirit. His conception is that faith is primary and aided by right reason. Not that faith must come under the judgment of unaided reason. And he has rejected the notion as well that there are two separate books of Revelation. For Vucius, scripture as illumined by the Spirit and received by faith is the foundation for right reasoning about all other things. Von Maastricht is very similar. In 1655, in his Vindication of the Truth, he writes that Holy Scripture is the norm of human reason. You want to be laughed off the planet? Go to the mall and say that. Scripture is the norm of human reason, according to Von Maastricht. He writes that that biblical theology is a subordinating science insofar as it correctly prescribes its conclusions as proved by the testimony of the first truth as principles to other sciences. For von Maastricht, reason was useful because it is necessary to understand Scripture. Without reason, we cannot perceive the truths of Scripture. For him, philosophy, that is, the right use of logic, polemic, rhetoric, etc., is useful to the pastor for unfolding Scripture to the people of God and for the apology for many that reject the Scripture because they may be moved by this logical use of Scripture such that the man of God uh, is said by these means to convince the gainsayer. He moves in a reasoned pattern from the Scripture. Of course, with that we might say, uh, the, the, the objection might arise where we might hear someone say something like, well, you know, Pastor Riddell, um, the, the Bible is certainly not a textbook for calculus, nor a textbook for physics. Well, it's certainly not a textbook. We agree with that. But I, I, but I will tell you what the Bible does. The Bible gives you the, the reasonable foundation and the ethical foundation, the moral foundation, for all other sciences. You see, I agree with von Maastricht that Bible reason is superior reason. That that everything else compared to the study of the Bible and what God requires of human beings generally, those are what we call subordinating sciences. They are underneath a right use of the scripture to inform every other endeavor. The man of God is complete unto a few good works, no. More than a few good works. No. Every good work by the scriptures. 2 Timothy 3.16. From this rather winsome foundation, we account now in our brief historical study to the great fall that divided faith and reason and rendered them in the thoughts of some as militants on opposite sides of the question of knowledge and both in this view destructive one to the other. And so, as, as, as Dr. Bill has rightly said, we have Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz. These men um, produced what they believed was a, was a reasoned way to knowledge. Except that when you finally get there, you find that what you've done is you've opened the door into a world darker than what you came from. And so we move down that road. Um, As such then, the the contents of Scripture, the doctrines of faith, they were all made subject to man's unaided reason. And so perhaps this view is epitomized by Rudolf Bultmann when he writes, Man's knowledge and mastery of the world have been advanced to such an extent through science and technology that it is no longer possible for anyone seriously to hold the New Testament view of the world. In fact, there is no one that does. 
This kind of rationalism pervades churches today as it also pervades our societal discourse. As God and the scripture are judged, they are brought to the bar of godless, soulless human reason. And it is demanded from them that they give an account. It is thought off limits to bring faith into an, in, into an intellectual discussion. No, sir, that's a different category, is what you'll hear. For faith has no business in such discussions. Truly, it is fast becoming the case that those who desire to live according to the principle, I believe that the Bible is the word of God, are maligned, shouted down, marginalized, patronized, and if things continue in their current trajectory, they will be rounded up as sheep for slaughter. From that side, we move on to the mystics. Devoid of reasonable content to faith, such as Schleiermacher and Kierkegaard, where religion becomes such a private and mystical thing that lives are comp compartmentalized into the secular and the sacred. We've all seen the wreckage of such a construction, especially as we come to modern evangelicalism, which has indeed been divested in large part of all propositional content, and only the emotions essentially remain, evidenced in vain repetition, in prayer and worship song, and sermons given by personal coaches of self-help psychology, stripped of the manly and robust content of Scripture. Truly, Dr. Bonson was correct when he stated that it would be nigh impossible to quantify the damage done to the visible church by such men. In this paradigm, reason has won the battle, described a moment ago, and is now unassailable. So, in order to salvage any kind of religion for faith commitment at all, it is mystified and emotionalized, and so supercharged with narcissism, so that this religion becomes about me and my feelings, the solipsism we heard about earlier. They've taken away my reason, but I still have my heart. And in this construction, religion appears all the more ridiculous to the watching world. And that which is irrational reigns. Contradiction is embraced as spirituality, and the people love to have it so. Indeed, human reason itself, in today's majority report, is the queen of all other sciences, including theology proper. God is now under the microscope, and he's being refashioned into a God believable to fallen men. And the offense of the cross has left the academy. But may I say, dear brothers and sisters, that this queen's crown is cracked. She is leprous and pocked, even though her cup is becoming more full of the blood of the saints in our age. Reason apart from faith did not serve innocent mankind except to plunge the race into ruin. And a ruined race is even more susceptible to her disease. Well, we have rushed a bit in our account of a modern situation. But I believe this is not without foundation, seeing that we are much agreed. And we watch these things take place every day with our head in our hands. With this then, let us provide a few definitions from Scripture on the terms of faith and reason and then provide a biblical construction, Lord helping us. If you'd like a brief but nifty little look at this from a modern and faithful scholar, I would recommend, uh, of course, Dr. Clark, but I would also recommend Dr. William Young and his fine essay in his collected writings on theory and theology. I have a short quotation from him and will have to suffice with that. Our Christian philosophies are tentative proposals subject to continual criticism and revision. The doctrines of the Christian faith are settled and are to be expounded by the Christian theologian on the basis of the revealed data of Scripture and in agreement with the creeds of the church. Philosophy can contribute, listen, to the clarification of theological concepts but may neither create nor destroy them. And I think that's very well said. All right, well, let's, let's work up a, a, a couple of definitions, and then we have a couple of scriptures to look at. First of all, when, the word, um, when we use the word faith in the context of faith and reason, we are speaking of the act of believing what scripture says because of its divine authorship and making those truths, propositions, and character, characterizations, histories, yea, all that scripture teaches, yes, including um, that Paul left his cloak in Troas, 
a part of our noetic structure. That, that is, it becomes the foundation for how we think. Some have, have titled this the objective use of the word, for it speaks of a content, a body of things to be believed. The faith, you'll see it used like that in scripture from time to time. Um, and beyond uh, these simple saving truths, it includes such things as Paul's cloak and Troas, the books and parchments he desired for his use in ministry and devotions. In other words, if we use this term faith rightly in the context of faith and reason, we will receive all that the scripture says, rightly interpreted according to the biblical rules of interpretation, primarily the analogia scripturae, that the Bible is its own best interpreter in all of these things. The Bible uses the word faith as it does many words in different ways at different times to communicate different things. The Bible does use equivocation, using words in different contexts. We must recognize that as good Bible scholars and exegetes so that we won't be tripped up, nor pigeonhole one particular word to always have to mean this. Even the original language um, has the same kind of equivocation. And, in your, and you know, translators are judged on on, um, on how, they, how they translate those words as, as better or worse, depending on those equivocations, right? And we all make those judgments as exegetes, as we're, as we're reading those original languages and seeing how they are translated in various places. For instance, in Luke chapter 8, verse 9, um, in Christ's explanation of the parable of the sower, he says that there are those who believe for a time. Well, this is not the, the faith that we've been talking about in faith and reason. Those that believe for a time is what James Durham and others of our Puritan fathers called temporary faith. What is instructive here is that the same gospel message that all the other soil conditions received as well was received by these folks that, were, that are described as stony ground. It was the same gospel, the same content that was received. And they believed only for a time. Temporary faith. Another example might be in John chapter 2 verses 23 through 25. We know here that although they believed Christ, it was on account of the miracles that he did rather than the word that he preached. And we hear in that passage Jesus, or the, the divine commentator John, saying uh, Jesus didn't commit himself to them. Although they believed on him, he didn't commit himself to them because he knew what was in man. He knew they were believing upon him for some substandard reason because they saw the miracles. Just like over in John chapter 6, right? They chased Jesus all the way to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And they say, Master, how'd you get here? And he says, truly you seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you ate of the loaves. So here's faith content right here, believing because of that. Here's faith believing because of miracles. And here's faith because you got your belly full. Right? And all of those, except for that first one, they are substandard uses of the word faith. You believe, Jesus says. You seek me, but why? Well, it's some substandard reason. This kind of faith also is not true saving faith. The Bible uses the word faith for the devils who believe that God is one, but they miss several other crucial essential truths so that they remain in their rebellion. James uses them as an example of how to believe some things and yet remain in rebellion against God, James 2.19. His point is that while we are justified by faith alone, the faith that justifies works by love. This is its characteristic. This is its mark. And so verse 23 makes it plain that James understands the imputation of the perfect righteousness of Christ upon the reformation principle of faith alone and we and he then are not confused here, despite the protestation of, say, Master Luther to the contrary. Further, the scripture also is very keen to instruct us in this fact, that the faith that saves is not a bare faith, but works by love. Those are the words of our confession. That works are posterior to justification, not anterior to it. And that, it often, that often the effects of faith are put for faith in scripture. Right? And so in Luke 17, 3, when the apostles uh, are talking to Christ about forgiveness, and Jesus says, you must forgive seven times a day, the apostles say, increase our faith. Not increase our forgiveness, but increase our faith. In other words, they're asking for the effects of that greater faith. They want what faith brings. And sometimes in Scripture, and there are many instances of this, time for which we don't have tonight, um, uh, 
the effects of faith are put for faith. Now, we must be careful there because there are some who have made those effects what justifies. We do need to be careful there. The effects are not what justifies. It's faith alone that justifies. Apart from works, the Apostle Paul is very clear to teach us. And yet, the Scripture uses that particular equivocation, so let's not be confused. And then the fifth thing is there's that objective faith that we spoke about earlier, uh, that which speaks of the content of revealed religion at various stages in redemptive history. Jude 1.3, contend earnestly for the faith. We've had that read already to us today, we understand. The faith. Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Right? And then also Acts 13, 8, 14, 22, 16, 5, and so on. All of these uses have this objective understanding of what faith is. That faith is the content, those things that are received by faith. Those truths of scripture that we take hold of mentally. That we, as our, as our short of catechism says, that we receive with faith and love, lay up in our hearts and practice in our lives. So then, um, briefly... Westminster Confession of Faith 14, 2, Saving Faith. That's the chapter on saving faith. Listen to this objective definition of faith. By this faith, a Christian believeth to be true whatsoever is revealed in the word for the authority of God himself speaking therein. Did you hear that? Whatsoever is revealed in the word is received by faith by the authority of God speaking. Not by the authority of, I have someone else's testimony over here that told me it's true. I have this, this, um, this criteria of judgment that I've worked out over the years and it's met that criteria. No. By force of he who spoke it. Because it's God's word it's received. And notice it's whatsoever is revealed in the word. All of it. We don't get to pick and choose. Why would we pick and choose? Just roll that back in your thoughts for a minute. Get out a legal pad and ask the question, why would we do that? And then start writing out potential answers. Every one of them take God off of his throne. Doesn't matter how many answers you come up with. So by this faith, a Christian believeth to be true Whatever is revealed in the word for the authority of God himself speaking therein and acteth differently upon that which each particular passage thereof containeth, yielding obedience to the commands, trembling at the threatenings, embracing the promises of God for this life and that which is to come. But the principal acts of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting upon Christ alone for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace." I think it's important here to note that the use of reason with this faith, that there is a rational understanding of the different parts of Scripture, its principal tenets, and also its effects. Did you notice how the divines bring reason and faith together? We're making a judgment. Do I need to be threatened here with this passage? Do I need to be comforted? What is that? That's a reasonable judgment. Reason and faith are coupled together in the minds of the divines, in other words. All right, so when we move on then to a definition of reason in Scripture, we're not left to wonder here as well. First, in an interesting play of words in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2, and really we do not have time to read through those two passages, the apostle uses wisdom and folly in such a wonderful rhetorical dance revealing that the best wisdom and reason of those who do not believe is at best folly before God and that the Lord has chosen what those unbelievers call folly over their wisdom through the foolishness of preaching. And can I ask you, what do you think Paul means when he says the foolishness of preaching? Preaching the word. Through the foolishness of preaching the word, the wisdom of this world is seen for the folly that it is. And it's just this wondrous rhetorical dance. I, 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 I know you plan on spending some time in these two passages coming up, so we won't, go, we, we won't tread too deeply or too far down that garden path. But think of what the apostle is saying there in that beautiful piece of rhetoric in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2. And so here we learn a most valuable truth from God. 
The world will call that which is true reason and wisdom folly at every turn. True wisdom and true reason they will call folly. But note also that while they are doing so, they condemn themselves and reveal their lack of wisdom. They reveal their folly instead. And yes, there is an objective standard by which we judge that. God's word. The implication is that God himself is reason and wisdom. And apart from faith in him, reason is not truly possible, but will always devolve into irrationality and foolishness. The Bible also uses reason in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. In this great passage, we learn that it is most reasonable, most rational to present ourselves as living sacrifices. That is the most reasonable and rational thing that you can do. Present yourself as a sacrifice. The world tells you what? Actualize yourself. Make sure you get everything you want. Step over other people if you need to. The Bible says the most reasonable thing that you can do is submit yourself a living sacrifice to God. Again, we see faith coupled with reason. I will remind us also that the context of a sacrifice in Scripture is public, and the instructions that also follow are public as well. In other words, it is, it is reasonable to offer in this public context to serve the Lord by taking our place among His people and serving Him as those sacrifices there. Where were sacrifices offered? Were they private worship? Mostly public, right? That's the context into which he speaks here. This is rational. This is reasonable. And therefore, we understand that to refuse this is truly irrational folly to stand as islands alone. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we also heard this scripture earlier today. Funny, we're finding ourselves in the same places in the scripture that teach uh, truth about knowledge in 2 Corinthians 10, we hear of the ministry of the word of Paul by the, and by application all preachers as to the responsibility of this ministry. And we see especially verses 1 through 5 where the apostle describes that his, the weapons of his warfare are not, uh, sorry, they are mighty instead of carnal because they are spiritual weapons. And when he says spiritual weapons, what do you suppose he means? They are things that appeal to the mind and to the reason. That's what he means by spiritual weapons. Yes, they are also energized by the Spirit of God. But where is the Spirit of God working? He's working upon our minds. And so it says that the goal, the, the end of this ministry is casting down logizome, casting down reasonings and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And may I say obedience there? Remember that we're talking about an obedience that rises up out of faith. It is believing Christ and everything he says. And bringing every thought to bear. All of your reasoning prowess. And putting it there. The Bible uh, also tells us. In uh, Psalm uh, 10 and verse 4, we can turn there, Psalm 10. Indeed, the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. It's one of those instances where we want to we want to update the language a little bit. God is not in any of his thoughts. That's what the psalmist is saying here. How much does God, the propositional content of scripture, relate to the thoughts of the wicked? Close your eyes, what do you see? That's how much. None. So then, in Romans 1, 21 through 23, we see the, that, that the apostle speaks of carnal man, unbelieving man, as he who has become vain in his understanding. Notice, he's not lacking for reason. He's lacking for right reason. And we'll look at that passage in a few moments. 
It does not mean then that the Bible and the Bible's religion are opposed to reason or opposed to knowledge or opposed to understanding as a cursory reading of the scriptures will no doubt reveal. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, we understand that there is particular and necessary knowledge. It's through the knowledge of him that called us to his own glory and virtue. And these things again are received by faith. All right, with those definitions then, let's turn back to three particular scriptures, and I will endeavor to be brief as we wrap up. So we're going to test our thesis according to these three remaining scriptures. Turn back to Hebrews 11 with me, if you will. When we look at Hebrews 11, chapter 11, especially verse 3. We understand something very, very clearly there. It comes leaping off the page after we heard that quotation from Anselm a little bit ago. What does the apostle say here? He says, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. You know, it, it, it's an interesting thing. The modern day mystics might say, through faith we understand that God is. Through faith we understand that God is triune. Through faith we understand that Jesus loves me. Or through you know, any certain thing that can be relegated off to that mystical pocket where no one can assail it. But notice what he says here. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. You see what he does here? He takes something that is unknown unknowable to men, and yet in their folly, that which they claim to know. And he says, through faith we understand. My dear brothers and sisters, may I tell you very, very candidly that it is through faith we understand the truth of all things, not just who made the world. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, verse 6. If it's impossible to please him, in any of our works without faith, it is certainly impossible to please him if we, if we divorce faith from our knowledge or knowledge falsely so called, right? We must not divorce faith from knowledge. It is indeed a part, it is part and parcel of what it means to think biblically as human beings created in the image of God. First, we see truly some effects of faith that are set forth here rather than a simple definition of faith in Hebrews 11. But the word for substance here, right? Faith is the substance of that, which, that for which we hope. It's the substance. It's that which gives it being. Notice he doesn't use faith is the hope for the things we hope for. He says it's the substance. And he's already used this word before in this book. Back in chapter 1, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, who says that he is the character of God, that he is the impress image of God's very being. It's that kind of being that faith brings to our present thoughts. That we take hold of biblical realities as realities, not just wishes, not just windmills. These are the things that are real. So he is there talking about what, what being is. It's the authentication of those things. Yes, we are receiving it on testimony. Yes, but don't we receive myriads of things on testimony all the time? It is only the folly of this world that says, I suspend my judgment. I don't take anyone's testimony. How could you get out of bed in the morning with an attitude like that? You've received some kind of testimony, even if it's your own historical testimony. Well, yesterday when I got up, the floor supported me. Maybe it will today. Is there any reason to do that? Not really. It's just historical habit. One day, which could fall through, right? Yeah. So... Um, 
Second, the word uh, for conviction or evidence of things not seen. In other words, this effect of faith is that we see what is unseen to us, not just to us, but we see the reality of it. It has a reality by which, though not seen, is real. He's going to go on in this chapter to describe some things that people did that they never saw to inform them of. They received the testimony of God. They received those very real things. By faith, Moses, when he was grown, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather the reproach of Christ and accounting it greater riches than all of Egypt. Through faith, Noah warned of things not yet seen, built an ark, to the saving of his house. What was real in that day? The same thing that's real today. What God told him and he received. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, when your divines tell you from Westminster, by faith we receive whatsoever is written in the word of God as spoken by God himself. They know what they're talking about. So, Second, conviction. And then in proof of this, the apostle gives us that great phrase, by faith we understand. By faith, something is brought to our present understanding that is real, concrete, veritable, not available to the senses, nor to our unaided and autonomous reason. Namely, that the worlds were framed by the word of God, the spoken word of God, such that the things we see did not give rise to themselves, they were created. They leapt into existence out of obedience to that voice of God. It's the only other way, that's the only way it could be. So I would like to reflect for a moment upon the choice of the apostle here. He chose the creation of the world as that true, unassailable um, thing that we take hold of by faith, completely outside of our reason and completely outside of our senses. And he said, that's what's true, and it's by faith we receive it. Turn with me to uh, Romans chapter 1. Faith and reason once again. So we had faith with reason in Hebrews 11. Now we have reason without faith in Romans chapter 1. And again, this is a passage we have already put a little footprint on today, isn't it? So Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ... For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful but, be, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise they became fools. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, into birds, into four-footed beasts, into creeping things. And we'll just stop right there. It's, a, it's, it, it, it's an interesting passage, and a lot of folks have, have taken it apart in this way, and they've taken it apart in that way. There's an obvious uh, parity here in the revelation of God's wrath versus the revelation of God's righteousness. Right? The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel and the wrath of God is revealed in the unrighteousness of men. But the other side of that is there's a decided contrast between the righteousness of God and the unrighteousness of men. And that contrast is what I'd like to bring out here this evening because that speaks to the natural man's unrighteousness in his reasoning such that while the truth slaps him in the face every day, he cannot deal with it, will not believe it, and will take that God that holds him up and instead will exchange him for some four-footed beast to worship instead. 
Now, I, I know that some translations have that these men hold the truth in unrighteousness. That's what the King James Version has that I'm reading from. Some other uh, tr translations will say that they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The Greek word katecho there is used all over the New Testament some, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30 times. And in many of those instances does not mean suppress at all. Rather, it means to hold tightly. And I rather prefer that reading here in Romans chapter 1. And let me tell you why. Because the natural man rises up out of bed every day and he is faced with the fact that God has written his own image upon his heart. He's faced with the fact that God has written his own face in all of creation. He's faced with the fact that he has the law of God written not savingly but according to judgment and inexcusability upon his heart. And with all of that, he holds on to that so very tightly because that is his life. He can do no other. It is how, his, how he is created. And so he holds it so tightly, but he holds it in unrighteousness. And he takes that truth that is so very plain. What does Paul say? It's clearly seen. And he takes that truth that is so very clearly seen. And what does he do with it? He says, God is not God. He holds it in unrighteousness. And so he thanks himself instead of thanking God. He will not call upon God. He will call upon himself or some feigned deity that he has invented, that he controls. He can do none else but to hold the truth tightly to himself in unrighteousness. He actually believes that when he, when he, um, when he goes into his bathroom in the morning and squeezes the toothpaste out on his toothbrush that the toothpaste is going to come out. He believes that. And a myriad of other things. Why would he believe that in his worldview? Why when he squeezes it doesn't the rest of the world climb in? He's counting on the world that God has made. He's counting on the regular order that God has created. He knows God created it. When he does something wrong and he has a twinge of conscience, he knows the righteous judgment of God. That's what verse 28 tells us. Right? That he knows the righteousness of, of God, that those who do such things are worthy of death. But he not only does them himself, but he encourages and approves others to do them. He completely turns away from God. And so he makes every particular use of his reason that God gave him to hide from God, to turn from God. Not to be thankful to God, not to glorify God, but to make an idol instead. This is what reason without faith gets you. And it will always do that. And then the third passage, and we are rushing to a close here. The third passage, turn back with me to Genesis chapter 3. We'll have to close with this. You know, the strangest one... one one of the most interesting passages of Scripture, I tell my congregation this, to help them with patience. Because, you know, Pastor Todd has the gift of on and on sometimes. And so, I always, I always tell them, well, here we are in, in Troas, and Paul is preaching, and, you know, the sermon goes till midnight. You know, everybody goes, oh, yeah, it goes till midnight. That's not the amazing portion of that passage. The amazing portion of that passage is that Eutychus falls out the window and he's lying on the ground as dead and Paul picks him up and says, no, 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 his life is in him. There's a, maybe a little bit of a controversy as to whether he was dead and, you know, in the laying on of Paul's hands he was revived. But what's so fascinating about that passage is that every other church I know, probably including our own, would say, you know, it's midnight, we've had almost a death here, let's go home. No, they go back to the upper room, Paul continues preaching till the break of day. <laughs> Okay, well, there you go. I don't intend to do that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. There you go. Okay, so um, one more scripture. But first I'd like to point out that the thrust of this lecture has been to show that the value of faith in our reasoning is inestimable. And I hope we have seen faith's necessity. Everyone, whether we admit it or not, comes to the task with some kind of faith commitment. It is folly for the Christian to give way in his commitment to others who cling tenuously to theirs, although unrealized, unassumed, and foundational. Right? It's folly for us to take the vantage point, the world view of those whose fallen reason leads to folly. We must never give up that field. 
So the last passage then is Genesis chapter 3. Let's go ahead and read. Now the serpent, I'm in verse 1, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. We can stop right there. There's a lot more we could read, but let's just stop there. So as we conclude this lecture then, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that probably 99% of you were already there. You, you know what I'm about to say. I don't really have to expound it much except to say this. How did faithless reason serve innocent humanity? We might just put, put our heads together and say, not very well. Did you notice the reasoned process? First of all, Satan comes and he throws doubt upon the revealed word of God. He begins to assault the foundation of right reason in the minds, and I'm going to say of Adam and Eve, because Adam's right there the whole time. I don't think this is you know, something we can shuttle off like that. So Adam and Eve are standing there, and Satan comes to them, and he begins to assault the foundation of your faith. My dear brothers and sisters, he's still doing it today. Don't be thrown. He's still doing it. He's still assaulting the foundation of your reason, and that is faith in God's word. And so he says, has God really said that? Did God really say that? And so there's an interplay that goes back and forth. And then Satan gives his, can I put it this way? Testimony. His testimony as to what the truth is. And it is contrary to what God has told them. God knows that in the day you eat thereof, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And like many of Satan's truths, they are half-baked. But notice, it was his design to move them off of their faith commitment to God's word to receive some other testimony instead. But notice that Eve didn't stop there. Because once she left the testimony of God and began to believe the testimony of the serpent, then what did she do? Then she looked at the fruit and said, it's pleasant. Then she said, it's good for food. Then she said, and he said, it's desirable to make one wise. You see, all they needed was that little nudge off of the faith commitment that they had to God's word, so that now all they need to do is complete that themselves while nudged off of faith in God's word, and so they begin to reason, and their reason is immediately darkened when they move off of faith in what God said. You see, it, and I know there, there are arguments between Christians about man's right reason in the estate of innocence. Huh? Huh? Did you hear what we just read? That they reasoned to the ruin of our race because they reasoned apart from faith? And it will always be so. The project of God in these days is illumining His Word by His Spirit such that we receive it and it informs everything else in our lives so that we begin to understand and to operate in this program of right reason. Reason that is full. It's like, it's like um, I used to work for this guy in Southern California and he was a sailboat guy. And there were a couple of times where we went down and helped him work on the boat. And, and sometimes if we were good little boys, he'd let us get on the boat, you know, that kind of thing. And so he had the boat out one day. And um, he was going on a particular course, and the wind was right behind him that day. And so what did he do? He put that spinnaker out front. 
And when that big spinnaker goes, and it's right in front of the bow, so that, the, so that the, there's, there's just that minimal amount of resistance, that water separator, as we used to call them, that water separator works just right, and that spinnaker is out front, and if the, if the wind is 8 or 9 knots, his speed is going to be 7 or 8 knots. If the wind is 10 knots, his speed is going to be 8 or 9 knots, because that spinnaker is full of the wind behind it. My dear brothers and sisters, make sure that your reason is full of faith. Full of faith. Do not come to this world as if you must make it up on your own because that would be the lie of the enemy of our souls. Let's stand and call upon the Lord in prayer.